welcome. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded and as the screen says, please keep yourself on mute and your cameras off just to help us with the bandwidth and the quality of the presentation. My name is Chris Withers. I'm the Broker Distribution Director uh, for Ecclesiastical and welcome to our latest webinar. Um, for those of you that haven't been to any of our webinars, you'll find that they're, they've all been recorded and they can be accessed on the Broker Training Hub on our website. Um, and the webinars have been complemented more recently by a series of podcasts. So for any of you that take your media through uh, podcasts, then Covered in 15 will have a wide range of topics as well. And we're joined today by Claire from uh, Mental Health in Business, a, a regular contributor to both webinars and podcasts um, with us and independently and, and particularly through Beaver. So hopefully familiar uh, to you. But um, the mental health um, topic is one that um, you know this week we've we've timed this webinar deliberately for this week because it was World Mental Health Awareness Day on Monday and you may have seen in the insurance press that we've released the results of our latest survey for brokers on mental health on their mental health and the headlines of that just to just to share um, and sort of I guess set the context for today is that you know, the main contributors to stress at work, <coughs> according to brokers, is uh, workloads, volume of uh, regulation and compliance and customer demands. Well, I think probably everybody on here, you know, that would uh, resonate with them. And the top three mental issues brokers have experienced in the past 12 months are stress triggered by external situations such as deadlines or meetings, anxiety, and the feeling of, of being overwhelmed. And there's a there's been a decline, according to the survey, in brokers being able to talk to their manager about their mental health from 61% in 2020 to 43%, which again is a worrying trend given that you know this webinar and others are designed to increase awareness of the importance of being able to talk to people and and recognise the the, uh, the signs for mental health. So that that survey is out in the in the press at the moment, and um, um, you you'll find the press release on our website. But just wanted to use that as context before I hand over to to Claire to to take us through this webinar. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. And it's it's really good to be here. And there's a few familiar faces I can see. Um, today, so it's nice to to recognise or names. I can't see your faces, but a few familiar names. So it's nice to see a few um, people that I know. Um, yeah, just just um, thinking about what what Chris was just sharing there in terms of some of those trends and some of what Ecclesiastical's broker research has has found. It is worrying, isn't it, to see that. Um, you know, the, the the problem, we know the problem um, hasn't got any smaller. Um, and, you know, the, it's, it is concerning to see that um, that fewer brokers feel able to speak with their manager. So I hope you're going to find this session really useful. Um, when the ecclesiastical team and my team were planning this session, um, we we planned this in very deliberately for this week so that it coincided with World Mental Health Day. And the session is is really aligned to the the some of the key themes of this year's World Mental Health Day. So I hope you're going to find it useful. I hope you're going to find uh, something that you can you can take away and think about, perhaps both from an organisational perspective and from a personal perspective. That's that's really the the intention of, of of this session that there'll be something in here for you all in terms of your businesses or your teams and also for you as individuals. So um, for those of you that haven't met me before, uh, my name of course is Claire Russell. I'm the CEO and the founder of Mental Health in Business. Um, the subject of, of mental health is um, it, it's, it's very personal for me and and something that I feel deeply, deeply passionately about. Um, I'm actually an insurance broker um, by background, so I was an insurance broker for 25 years. I started out in the industry straight from school, and by the time I was 20, I had started my first brokerage. Um, I've loved my time in the industry. 
uh, I retired as an insurance broker in March of last year. Um, and I actually ran this business, Mental Health in Business, and my former brokerage alongside one another for three years, um, which was an interesting time. Um, but I, I became really passionate about mental health because of my own journey with mental illness. I had a breakdown about seven or eight years ago and when I was still in the insurance industry and experiencing that time of, of mental illness, which in all probably went on for maybe two or three years, but my breakdown happened over the space of a year. Um, and experiencing that period of time um, when I when I was living with mental illness really opened my eyes to my own uh, vulnerability, I guess. But also it opened my eyes to what was going on around me in my business and in the wider industry and in the world. Um, of course, it's certainly not something that's limited to the insurance industry. Um, and it made me really passionate about helping people. So I took some time out of the insurance industry and I began to retrain. And then I came back into the industry after about 18 months or so and was really determined to start bringing what I was learning into, into my business. So I reinvested in another brokerage and um, and started to, to bring what I was learning in into, into my business and into my team. And then sadly, a, a year later, I lost my partner to suicide and going through that experience was really the catalyst for me to think about what I wanted to do with my life and how I wanted to use my experience and the knowledge that I had built over the years. And so I started this business, Mental Health in Business, in 2018. So we work with businesses to help them to create psychologically safe and, and healthy workplaces and we, we do that through training and education and support um, and I also spend a lot of my time speaking so I'm a professional speaker and I, I spend a lot of time speaking at events and and things like that as well uh, which I enjoy very much I have to say. So the session objectives for today so by attending this session you should be able to summarise the individual and organisational impact of mental ill health. You should be able to identify some barriers to social inclusion, to support and to people getting access to the right care when they need it. You should be able to explain the commitment needed as individuals and as organisations to positive mental health. You're going to hear me using that phrase positive mental health a lot and you should be able to understand how all of us as individuals can contribute to a society in which mental health is really valued and promoted and protected. So as I'm sure you are all aware and as we have mentioned it was World Mental Health Day on Monday and the theme this year um, for World Mental Health Day is really centred around um, how we can create the conditions for everyone to experience good mental health. It's about achieving equality in health and in, in, in mental health. So the pandemic really has and continues to take a really significant toll on our mental health. And I really think that Awareness Days, like World Mental Health Day, provide us with a really good opportunity to reflect on where we are and to think about how we can rekindle our efforts to protect and improve mental health. You know, it may seem to you like there's been a lot of talk. Maybe you've seen a lot of webinars over the last two or three years around the subject of, of mental health. But my question to you is, you know, is that translating into action? Is that translating into meaningful activity within your organisations and your teams? And if it's not, why not? You know, the problem of mental health is bigger than ever before. And the insurance industry is an industry that's really very significantly affected. 
So lots of aspects of mental health have been challenged over this last couple of years. Already before the pandemic in 2019, an estimated one in eight people globally were living with a mental health disorder. And at the same time, the services, the skills, the funding available for mental health remain in short supply and fall far below what is needed, especially in low and middle income countries. The COVID-19 pandemic has created a global crisis for, for mental health. Of that, there is absolutely no doubt. And that's fueling short and long term stresses and also undermining the mental health of millions of people. Some estimates put the rise in both anxiety and depressive disorders at more than 25 percent during the first year of the pandemic. I would suggest that that's far greater than that by now. So some studies suggest that the number of people experiencing anxiety and depression has more than doubled over the last couple of years. And at the same time, mental health services have been severely disrupted and the treatment gap for people with mental health conditions has widened. But there are other factors that are impacting on our mental health and well-being, growing social and economic inequalities, protracted conflicts, violence, public health emergencies. All of these things affect whole populations, really threatening the progress towards improved well-being. There have been a staggering 84 million people worldwide that were forcibly displaced during 2021. We can only begin to imagine the mental health impact of that. And actually, let's look around us. How many of us have um, colleagues or friends who have family members um, that are living in some of the, the countries that are affected by what's going on in the world just now. So, you know, it's not just um, happening to other people, it's all around us. We really must deepen the value and the commitment that we give to mental health as individuals, as communities, and governments and organisations must really match that value with more commitment, with more engagement and with more investment by all stakeholders. We really need to strengthen mental health care so that the full spectrum of mental health needs is met through a community based network of accessible, affordable and quality services and supports. There's a lot of barriers that prevent people from getting the help that they need. Stigma and discrimination continue to be really significant barriers to both social inclusion and access to the right care. Really importantly, all of us, every one of you sitting on this session today can play a really important part in helping to break down that stigma. Um, and we can do that by increasing awareness, by sharing information, by being a part of the conversation, um, by sharing good news stories, by sharing information about what preventative health, mental health interventions work. I think World Mental Health Day and this time um, around it is a really good opportunity to do that collectively. We in, in my business, in mental health in business, we envision, envision a world where mental health or good mental health, positive mental health is really valued and promoted and protected and where everybody, whether they have a mental health disorder or not, is given an equal opportunity to enjoy good, positive mental health. So, Let's just think about the mental um, health impact. So the impact that mental ill health has, both in terms of um, individually and collectively and um, on our economy. So there has been a huge body of, of work that has emerged since 2017, all looking at workplace mental health. And that's really positive. You know, we we have a greater level of awareness now than ever, really, in terms of 
um, you know, what we need to be doing, what the impact of poor mental health, what the impact of not prioritising good mental health, just what, what that impact can be. So um, there was a, a report that was um, produced in 2017, which some of you may be aware of, which is the Thriving at Work report. And, and that piece of work um, really then um, paved the way for, for lots of other really powerful, helpful studies looking at um, mental health, looking at workplace mental health and well-being. So, you know, there is a greater level of awareness. There's more information available to us. Most business leaders now want to do the right thing by their employees and are aware of their legal and moral obligations. The COVID-19 pandemic absolutely has accelerated the movement of workplace mental health and well-being up the intelligent business leaders agenda. And it's also seriously exacerbated the problem. You know, we know that more people than ever before are experiencing symptoms of mental ill health and are in need of both professional help and appropriate care and support from their employer. So I'm going to share a couple of stats with you now that just help to illustrate the, the cost and the impact of poor mental health. And before I do, what I want to say is this, the human cost of mental ill health is incalculable. We can't put a number on it. It's not something we can quantify. People's lives are dramatically affected by mental illness, and that can result in broken relationships, broken families, career aspirations and businesses adversely affected, financial ruin in some case, lower life expectancy and quality of life, and in some cases, very sadly, loss of life. So while the provision of appropriate professional mental health care absolutely remains the responsibility of medical professionals, business leaders do have a really vital role in creating psychologically safe working conditions for their employees. Why is that? Why is that? Well, people spend a lot of time at work. We spend a lot of time at work, don't we? And the right working conditions can contribute really, really significantly to good mental health and well-being. Having rewarding and fulfilling work can be a powerful protective factor against poor mental health. And for those that live with mental health conditions or experience the symptoms of mental ill health, having the right support in place at work can be a huge contributor to recovery and to wellness. So let me just share a few statistics with you just to just to kind of build that picture really in terms of the impact of poor mental health. So we know there's been a 25 percent increase at least in anxiety and depressive disorders since 2020. We know that nearly one billion people globally are living with a mental health disorder. They are just the people with the diagnosis, so that number is likely to be far greater. We know that there's been an increase of 25% in the cost of poor mental health to employ employers compared to 2019. Poor mental health now costs UK employers up to £56 billion a year. And that's increased from £45 billion in 2020, and it was about £34 billion in uh, 2017 when that um, study was last carried out. The cost of presenteeism costs £30 billion, so that's what it costs UK businesses annually. Um, you know, we know that the cost of mental ill health is rising exponentially. It's increased 16 percent in the last three years. So I have a question for you all. And those of you that have been on sessions that I have run before will know that I like to get a little bit of interaction. So there are going to be a couple of questions that I'm going to pose um, during the course of this session. So I'm going to ask you, can you guess the annual cost of poor mental health? in the insurance industry and i'm gonna i'm gonna we'll quantify this by looking at it um in terms of the cost per person employed so can you guess what it costs the insurance industry on average 
per person employed and if anybody's willing to have a guess at that then put your answer in the chat box and the lovely Chris Withers is going to read out some responses so can you guess what it costs the insurance industry annual cost per person employed that's not per person employed that has mental illness by the way per person employed is anyone brave enough to have a guess who will start our bidding There's no such thing as a silly guess. 15 million we've got. So thank you. Yes. So we've got a um, thousand pounds. A thousand pounds per person employed. Thank you for that. Um, um, so another guess got, there at 1500. Yeah. Yes. Oh, you're seeing them now. Good. I'm seeing them yeah. now. So yeah, well, OK, they're a long way off. So the average cost per person employed in the insurance industry is £3,700 per person employed per year. Staggering. So the average cost of, uh, across all sectors, all professions is about £2,500 per year. But insurance and financial services are uh, much higher at three, uh, approximately £3,700 per person employed per year so not good is it so why are we not doing more so um just a couple more stats and then we'll move on um so we know that 28 percent of employees of individuals have either left employers in 2021 or are planning to leave their jobs in 2022 with 61 percent of those citing poor mental health as the reason that they are living, they're leaving, I should say. Um, two in five, 41% employees said their mental health had worsened during the pandemic. And 36% of UK working adults said they've actively used tools to help them manage their mental health. I see that as a positive, actually. You know, that's more than a third of UK working adults are engaging in their own wellness. So it's a sad state of affairs that that many feel they need help, but there is a positive in there, which is that they are engaging in their own wellness. And we now know that nearly 40% of total turnover costs are now attributable to mental health issues. So pretty staggering, hey? So that comes from the latest Deloitte Mental Health and Employers Report, um, which was published in about April 2022. So, okay, the theme of World Mental Health Day um, centres around this idea of good mental health for all in order that we can achieve as a society, that we can achieve that ideal of everyone being supported to experience good mental health and well-being. It is important that we first understand what might be the barriers to social inclusion, support and access to the right care. So I'm going to put a question to you again, um, and I'm going to call on Chris just in case the um, I can't see them as they come in from the chat. So again, put your answers into the chat box. So what do you think might be some of the barriers that people experience to them being included within society to them being supported in the way that they need and to them accessing the right care and of course we're talking about people who are experiencing mental illness so what do you think might be some of the barriers to social inclusion to support and access to the right care we've got, we've got some suggestions coming through so embarrassment lack of understanding yeah stigma Lack of support, not knowing where to turn. Judgment. Yeah, all of these things. Isn't it surprising, you know, after all of the awareness raising that's happened over the last three, four, five, six years, um, that there's still that lack of understanding there's still that lack of knowledge in terms of where to go, 
what kind of help is available, where, where to go for it. There's still that stigma, there's still that fear of judgment, what people will think about us if we admit to experiencing symptoms of mental ill health. So thank you for your contributions. They're really um, they're really valued and really appreciated. And and you really have spoken to the key points that I was hoping to uncover. So the first and I think biggest barrier is stigma. Sometimes people avoid seeking professional help because they don't want to get labelled in a specific way. Even when they have a sense that seeking treatment could help them, they suffer in silence. Long held stigma about mental illness and mental health conditions can prevent people taking action for their own wellness, even when they know they need to. Fortunately, the tide is shifting. More and more people are talking openly about mental health. People are starting to understand that mental illness works just like physical illness. It's not the person's fault and it often won't get resolved without treatment. So one of the other points that you made, and again, one of the points I was hoping to uncover is lack of awareness and knowledge about mental illness. Some people don't seek mental health care because they don't understand it. They don't understand mental illness. Think about it like this. If a person doesn't know, so they've got, let's say they've got an oddly shaped mole on their shoulder, okay? If a person doesn't know that an oddly shaped mole could be skin cancer, they won't see a doctor about it. If people don't know that their recurring anxious thoughts could be a diagnosable and treatable condition, they won't see a mental health professional about it. If a person doesn't know that their sudden loss of energy and interest in the things that they enjoyed before could be diagnosable and treatable depression, they don't know to seek treatment. Even now, even today, after all the awareness raising stuff that's happened in the last few years, there is still a lot of misunderstanding about mental health and mental illness. Access and affordability. Even when people think they may have a mental health condition and want to get help with it, they can face other barriers to mental health care. Language barriers lack of support, learning difficulties, all of these things may present problems for people accessing support. Mental health services are notoriously stretched and that can mean that there are challenges accessing services and in some cases really long waiting times. For some people seeking help privately might be viable and for others it may just simply not be affordable. So that, you know, issues of access and affordability can really come into play for a lot of people. The next one is access, uh, sorry, uh, interse intersectionality. Um, what do I mean by intersectionality? Physical illness, disability, domestic abuse, institutional racism, sexual or gender identity discrimination, all of these things bring with them their own challenges. And if an individual is facing more than one of these factors, then it can make gaining access to help and support even more challenging for them. So those are some of the key barriers to people getting access or getting the support or being um, included within society. Um, and of course, there are others, but those are the those are the key areas. So we have looked at the individual and organisational impact of mental ill health. We've identified some of the barriers to social inclusion, to support and access to the right care. Let's look now at what commitment is needed, both as individuals and as organisations to positive mental health. Let's start with organisations, first of all, and this is relevant to everyone. You know, you don't need to be an organisational leader sitting on this session in order for this section to be relevant to you. Some of you may be organisational leaders. Some of you may be team leaders. 
all of us play a part, whether we're a leader or not, some of all of us play a part in contributing to the culture of the organisation that we work within. So I'm going to share um, a few key ideas in terms of what we need to be doing within every organisational setting. So, so the first is we need to create a psychologically safe workplace. What does that mean? It means creating the conditions where every person feels safe to be themselves and to speak up about how they are feeling and to ask for help when they need it. To know that they're not going to be judged. One or two of you said in, your, in the comments in the chat, you talked about embarrassment, you talked about judgment. We need to know that we can speak up, we can be ourselves, we can speak about how we're feeling and we can ask for help when we need it and to know that that's going to be received positively and without judgment. We need in every organisation, we need to be looking at what's going on at all levels of the organisation or within every team. We need to be thinking about the whole team, the leadership of any organisation or any team needs to be fully on board with whatever mental health initiatives are being invested in within that business or within that team. And also those leaders, be they organisational leaders or team leaders, also need to be modelling good, healthy practices themselves, behaviours that promote and protect positive mental health. You know, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't work if you've got leaders that are saying one thing and then doing another. It's incongruent. So, you know, if we're trying to build a positive, um, supportive uh, workplace culture in which there genuinely is that psychological safety and in which, um, you know, we have a culture of um, of good, positive mental health, then we need to see the leaders modelling those healthy behaviours themselves. A great example of this, um, which is something that maybe you you will be familiar with, is Lloyd's Banking Group. I often use them as a as an example. The CEO Antonio Horta Osorio um, experienced some quite serious mental health issues himself. And he took quite a long period of time off work in order to recover from mental ill health. And he spoke about that very vulnerably, very openly. He shared his experiences. I've seen him talk um, and he does speak very openly and very vulnerab vulnerably about his experiences. And on his return to work, he then led extraordinary change in Lloyd's Banking Group from a a well-being and mental health perspective and their whole senior leadership team underwent mental health training and you know that that's how you affect real change um, culture change within an organization so the next one is training and education it's really important in every business in every organizational setting that there is an ongoing program of training and education for mental health and well-being. It isn't a tick box exercise. It is not a one time um, deal. You know, the, the needs, the mental health and well-being needs of your team, of your organisation are going to be constantly evolving and they're going to be constantly challenged by all of those outside influences that we've been talking about. So there needs to be an ongoing programme of training and education. It's really important to equip the right people with the right skills. There have been two um, pieces of work or um, guidance that has come out um, this year. Um, so NICE um, published their workplace mental health guidelines. I think that was in March of this year. And the World Health Organization have just this month produced their workplace mental health guidelines. Both of those guidelines apply to all organisations of every sort, and both of them have a big emphasis on training and education, and particularly equipping line managers with the right skills to be able to manage their teams effectively from a wellbeing perspective and to spot the signs of mental ill health within their teams. So what else is helpful within an organisational setting? Mental health champions. So we need to have people within 
every organisation. They may be mental health first aiders or, or perhaps not. They might be they might be different roles. We need mental health champions, people who are equipped to drive positive mental health initiatives. It's not all about responding to crises. It's about driving positive mental health initiatives so that we are supporting positive, good mental health for everybody. If we're going to have people in those roles in our organisations, they need to have the bandwidth to fulfil their roles. They need to be fully supported and people need to be um, fully aware of what that role is all about and how to access how to access those people. Depending on the size of the, the, the organisation, there should be a mental health and wellbeing leadership team, or at the very least, somebody at a leadership level who is empowered to follow through on the pledges that the organisation has made and who can really drive through and implement meaningful cultural change. Communications. So I think that awareness days like world mental health day and we had world suicide prevention day in september we've got um, men's mental health month in november um, and then we've always got um, mental health awareness week in may and then there's a few others throughout the year i think those awareness days are vitally important don't um I, I mean, some people say that they're virtue signalling. I have to disagree. They are a great opportunity for us to refocus our attention and our efforts on something that is vitally important within every organisation and make sure that this is a year round um, thing in your organisation. There should be consistent internal communications. It doesn't matter how big or small your organisation is. We work with some very small businesses. It, you know, it's no less, in fact, it's probably even more important in a smaller business where the ripple effect of mental ill health can be felt um, so much. So there needs to be consistent internal communications to raise awareness on mental health issues and to promote positive mental health. There should be a 12 month rolling comms plan, not just centred around those awareness days. What else? Just a couple of things. There should be a mental health philosophy. Every organisation should have some sort of pledge, some sort of philosophy, which communicates um, what it is that their business is striving to achieve in terms of the mental health and well-being of the people within their business. Believe me when I say there is nothing more important than the mental health and well-being of the people in your organisation, because without it, you're not going to achieve your results. So every organisation should have a clear mental health philosophy, and that needs to be a lived philosophy, not just a poster on a wall. It needs to be um, meaningful, it needs to be congruent with what's really happening within the organisation. And then lastly, um, organisational policies and processes. Just, you know, take a mental health lens to them if you've not already done that. It's really important that you think about all of those different management processes, all of those different policies um, that you might have in place and make sure that you've taken a mental health lens to them. OK, so we have talked about what we need to do from an organisational perspective. Um, and as I said at the beginning, you know, that applies to um, to all of you here. You know, we don't need to be an organisational leader um, in order to take some of that away and implement some of that. Um, you know, all of this is relevant to, to our teams as well. And you know, we all, as I've said, we all contribute to the culture that exists within our organisation. But let's think about now, what can we do as individuals? Um, and again, I'm going to put a question to you before I share my own thoughts with you, because I'd love to know what you think on this. So what do you think that as individuals we can all do to contribute to a society in which mental health is valued and protected and promoted. And again, use the chat box and any thoughts that you have, um, share them in there. And let's have a let's have a let's have a see what you think.
So we've got to uh, encourage more conversation. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we were having a conversation before we started about, you know, how are people feeling about mental health? You know, what's the, um, you know, we know that lots of people are struggling, but, you know, how are, how are people thinking about, you know, this, this kind of activity? Um, you know, do people think there's enough um, or there's been too much? You know, and, and my position on this is, you know, that there's never going to be too much. You know, we need more conversation. We need more openness. We need, um, you know, more meaningful activity to be going on um, within our organisations and within society too. So any other thoughts? Listen to people. Provide a safe environment for people to open up. Yeah, you know. People need to feel safe, don't they? You know, it's a really vulnerable thing to do. So we are much better at talking about mental health in a general sense, right? Um, we do it every day now, I think. It's it's just a topic of conversation that we all talk about. And what's still really challenging is to put your hand up and say, um, I'm actually not feeling good. I'm really struggling at the moment and to ask for help. There's a lot of vulnerability in doing that. Um, so people need to know that it's safe. They need to know that, you know, they're not going to be met with judgment and they're going to be heard. They're going to be listened to and they're going to be supported. So, yeah, I love that one. Thank you. Any other ideas? Yeah, there's focus more on positive outcomes when people talk. Yeah, so I think what you mean by that is, um, you know, kind of perhaps thinking about what what solutions are and looking at, you know, the different ways of help and the different positive um, actions that we can take perhaps within the context of workplace. Um, or, or maybe you're also thinking about, um, you know, kind of sharing um, the results of that, you know, sharing some um, happy endings, you might call them, you know, when people have had um, you know, when they have reached out for help, what, what's been the outcome of that? What's helped them? Um, and talking about some of those, um, you know, solutions and what's helped people, I think can be, um, can be really, really positive and really helpful uh, because in somebody else's solution, we may see a solution for ourselves as well. So, yeah, I think that's great. Thank you. Any other ideas? Yeah, there's been a few more actually. Um, avoid criticism and don't react as if any issues are small. Uh, look out for signs that someone may be struggling. Free up time in the diary each week to consider where you are, how you are, um, and signposting help, whether internal or external. Yeah, I love I love those. I love that one about freeing up some time. Um, you know, I don't know about you, everyone on this this session, but you know. Life feels busier than ever before. Um, you know, I, I I seem to just go from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. And I'm sure that you probably all are experiencing similar. And I love the idea of just freeing up some time, not for anything specific, but, you know, to just consider where you are, to reflect, reflect on how you're feeling and how you're doing and what help and support you might need. I think that's... Um, I think that's a fantastic suggestion. And also that that last one that you just mentioned, Chris, about signposting. I think that's really important. Please, if you work within an organisation, equip yourself with some information about what support is available internally. So, you know, most organisations will have something. Most organisations will have maybe an employee assistance programme or in some cases, private medical insurance or in some cases, um, mental health first aiders, there should be mental health first aiders now in, in all organisations, really. Um, find out some information about all of those things and what's available so that you can share that. You can signpost people to that um, when you get the opportunity. And there's been one more added, um, which is don't tell someone who is suffering to simply get over it. Oh, yeah, thanks, whoever shared that. Thanks. I've had that before. I've been told to cheer up, get over it. It could be worse. That's not what anybody needs. Um, you know, that's the last last thing that some 
that somebody needs who's struggling with their mental health. Um, you know, we need to be met with compassion and understanding. And, you know, if you don't understand what somebody is experiencing, ask them, you know, ask some questions, seek to understand what their experience is so that you can be better equipped to support them going forward. But I love that. Thank you. So I'm going to share some of my thoughts now. So firstly, share our own experiences um, don't underestimate how powerful that is. Um, you know, sharing our experiences can help other people not to feel alone. Um, you know, I know from 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 personal experience when I was deep in the quagmire of my mental ill health, I felt very alone with that. I felt very isolated. I felt like the only person in the world that was feeling like that. And of course, I wasn't. Um, so by sharing our experiences, we help other people not to feel alone. Uh, be willing to be vulnerable. It kind of ties in with that. Um, and I think that we're a little afraid of vulnerability, you know, as um, particularly those of us that are in leadership roles, we're a little bit afraid to be seen as vulnerable. And I, I think it's a very, very powerful leadership quality. Um, you know, to be willing to be vulnerable to, um, you know, to, to to speak about the challenges that we're experiencing um, and, you know, not always to be presenting, um, you know, a kind of mask or a strong appearance for the outside world. That willingness to be vulnerable is really important. Educate ourselves. You know, quite a few times we've mentioned we don't understand, we don't have enough information. Well, Let's take personal responsibility for that. You know, let's educate ourselves. Hopefully there are programmes of education going on within your organisations. And if there aren't, then educate yourself. You know, there's a world of information out there, um, most of which is available or lots of which is available free. Um, you know, YouTube, good old Google. Um, you know, there's so much information, mental health charities like Mind, um, the Mental Health Foundation. Um, Mind is a brilliant charity, actually, for sharing of, of information. You know, you can do a search on the Mind website for any uh, mental health issue or um, disorder or condition, and you'll get loads of really useful information. So if somebody is experiencing something that you don't understand, you know, ask them some questions and maybe just go and do a little bit of research and educate yourself too understand the barriers that might exist for others we've talked quite a bit about that today um we may not know what those barriers are um, and we only know that by um having those conversations by talking to people by listening to them and their experience but we really do you know we need to understand that you know if somebody's coming from a, a different cultural background to us there may be a cultural barrier there um you know if if somebody is um, if English isn't their first language, there, there could be language barriers. Um, you know, if there's a physical illness or a disability, um, that might present problems in, 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 in accessing help and support and, you know, all the other things that we talked about. So understand the barriers that might exist for others. Advocate for others. Now, it's important that we know that you don't have to be a mental health medical professional in order to advocate for someone else. Um, so, you know, if we know that we've got a friend, a family member, a colleague at work who is struggling and who is struggling to advocate for themselves, if, if they want us to, and if it feels helpful and if it feels OK for, for you to offer, then you can advocate for them. You know, and that may be advocating for them with their line manager. It may be helping to facilitate a conversation um, with a, a line manager or with a mental health first aider because they're too nervous to make that first step themselves. It may be sitting with them while they make a phone call to their GP. Maybe it would be a, a, attending a, an appointment to see a doctor with them um, if that's something that seems like it might be helpful in, in, in the, those particular circumstances. The next one is volunteer. Um, I'm a huge fan of 
volunteering. I've been a volunteer myself for about eight years now. I volunteered as a listening volunteer with Samaritans for about seven years and I stepped down just recently from that frontline role. I'd been on the front role for, for over seven years and it's a long time to be doing something like that. Um, and and I um, decided that it was time for me to, to take a break from that particular role. And at the moment I'm volunteering with Papyrus, uh, which is another suicide prevention charity who focus their efforts on young people. Um, and so I'm, I'm working as an ambassador with Papyrus at the moment. Volunteering is incredibly rewarding. There are hundreds and hundreds of fantastic volunteer led organisations who are crying out for your help. Um, I'm always happy to talk to anybody about volunteering and, and about what I have gained through being a volunteer. It's been the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. And I don't, you know, I, I, I don't say that lightly. So, um, you know, look into volunteering. You know, you don't have to give a lot of time. Um, you know, as human beings, we all need a sense of purpose. And gosh, does volunteering give you a sense of purpose? It's very rewarding. Um, and it's a way that we can contribute to exactly what we're talking about, creating a society in which mental health is really valued and, and promoted. Be part of the conversation. Um, you know, th this conversation needs to not stop. It needs to be ongoing. If you see, if you go to a great webinar, um, and you see a really great speaker um, and you're really impacted by that, go away and share that. Um, share the link to the recording. Um, not that I'm hinting that you should share the link to this recording with all your friends and colleagues, but of course you should when it's available. Um, but you know, be part of the conversation. Um, you know, share best practice, share experiences, um, ask questions. Um, you know, if you're not sure what's going on in your organisation, ask, um, you know, just be a part of that conversation. We all have a vested interest in creating psychologically safe workplaces and in in having a society where mental health, good mental health is really valued and promoted. Have healthy boundaries yourself. This is something I bang on about a lot. I do quite a lot of one to one mental health coaching with people who are really struggling with their mental health. And this is what this is something that I talk about a lot. If you're going to prioritise your own mental health and well-being, if you're going to prioritise the creation of time for self-care, then you're going to need to have some healthy boundaries in place in order to allow you to do that. Um, establishing brown boundaries is not selfish. Um, it's a really, really healthy thing to do. And leaders, please model that behaviour within your organisations. So just a couple more. Value work-life balance. Now, when I talk about work-life balance, I'm not necessarily talking about working less. Um, what I'm talking about is making sure we've got some balance in life, making sure that however hard we are working, we are creating the time that we need for the things that we love for the people we love, for the things that we want to do with our time outside of work. Make sure that we've got that balance. Two more. Um, challenge stigma. Um, you will hear it regularly, um, no doubt. I do, everywhere I go. Um, so it happened to me uh, Friday of last week. So I was, um, actually, I was in, I was in London, um, at Ecclesiastical's office, actually, um, for a couple of days last week, doing some training. And while I was in London on the Friday morning, I thought I'm going to treat myself to a nice coffee and a croissant before I go into the office. So I'm sitting in the office in this coffee place just around the corner from Ecclesiastical's London office. And the people on the table next to me were having a very loud conversation. So I wasn't um, earwigging on their conversation. Um, I couldn't help but overhear it because they were very loud on the table next to me, talking in very negative terms about the mental health of one of their colleagues. I'm happy to say definitely not ecclesiastical employees. Um, and they were talking in very negative terms about the mental health of one of their colleagues and they had all sorts of not very nice things to say. And I sat there for a few seconds and I thought, OK, I can't 
I can't sit here and listen to this conversation. So I went and I inserted myself politely into their conversation and I asked them, would they be willing to hear a different perspective on the circ on the situation that, were, that they were discussing? And I then shared a different perspective and we ended up having a great conversation. They weren't offended. Um, you know, it, it, it all turned out really well. Um, and in fact, they asked me for a business card and have invited me since to go in and talk to their business about how they can create a more healthy culture around mental health. So don't underestimate the value and the power of challenging stigma when we come across it. And the last one is don't normalise stress. Now, stress is normal. <laughs> uh, stress is a fact of life. We can't eliminate it. Um, when I mean when I say don't normalize stress, what I mean is don't normalize living with the negative effects of stress all the time. So a little bit of stress here and there probably helpful. It gives us uh, keeps us moving. It motivates us. It means that we get stuff done. And um, what we need to do is um, not normalize um, high levels of stress that are all the time and where we're experiencing the negative effects of stress, where that's showing up in how we are feeling in our physical health, in our mental health um, and, and, and in just generally how we're feeling. So, you know, if you're finding yourself experiencing high levels of stress persistently, then please speak to somebody about that. Go and speak to your line manager or somebody um, senior within your organisation and have a conversation about that. Um, you know, there is a responsibility upon every organisation to make sure that they are not, that work is not making people sick and that includes mental health. So if stress levels are too high, then people ultimately are going to become sick and that's not OK. So please go and talk to somebody if, if you are experiencing that. So we are almost at the end of our allocated time for today's session. Those were the session objectives. I said that by the attending by attending the session, you should be able to do all of those things. I hope you can. I hope you've taken something of value away. I know it's been recorded and, and the recording will be shared. I'm going to send Chris the slides and I'm very happy for those to be shared too. And if there are any questions, we've got a couple of minutes and I'm very happy to take them. Great, thank you, Claire. And always very well managed with the time as well. So yeah, <laughs> time for time for some questions. I'm also just going to post in the chat a link to the press release that I referenced at the start because I was just listening to what Claire was saying there about sort of finding a way to stimulate the conversation and 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 maybe even the research that we've done, it's brokers telling us how they're feeling about it, maybe sharing that amongst your colleagues in your mm -hmm. business we'll give you a reference point to say, well, do we feel like this? Is this mm -hmm. is this typical? So if it provokes and helps that, then then I've shared that within the within the chat. But um, yeah, if, if there are any questions, please do pop them in the chat. Um, it's and, always a bit nerve wracking, isn't it? When everybody's, yeah. you know, you've got other people and, you know, all that kind of thing. I've shared my contact details there. Um, if you have questions or thoughts that you don't want to share, in, in you know in a public forum that's fine um, my details are there send me an email or you can get in touch of course with Chris and I'm sure Chris you'll be happy to um, forward on anything that comes your way if I can help with anything absolutely so um yeah so we'll wrap it up there thank you everybody for for giving up an hour of your time but I hope you'll all agree that it was a beneficial hour of your time so thank you to Claire for that and if you do want a copy of the slides then just contact your account manager and, and we'll share those with you. The recording will be on the website and I would highlight again, just reiterate, go back to the ones that we've done with Claire before and they're all on the broker training hub on our website. So lots of great resources there. So thank you all. Thank you, Claire. And um, see you all again next month for our next webinar. Bye.